Well, good afternoon. We want to welcome everybody here today and thank you for taking time to uh, join us. We will have a number of members that will be coming in uh, as we are speaking, but we appreciate you taking the time to uh, pack in here today. One of the things you'll notice about this press conference is it's bipartisan. We will be joined by the uh, co-chairman of the Congressional Prayer Caucus, Mike McIntyre, in just a few moments, um, and we have members from both parties. It's also a press conference which includes members of Congress and non-members of Congress because they're all representative of millions of Americans across this country who are concerned about the National Day of Prayer. Uh, we're here today, unfortunately, because of this decision that was rendered on April 15th in the Western District of Wisconsin by a single federal judge. That judge took it upon herself to determine and to declare that the National Day of Prayer was unconstitutional. Now, it's important as we start to note, that's not what the Constitution says. That's what one unelected judge says the Constitution says. It's also important for us to note that the effect of what this judge's decision was, was basically to substitute her opinion for almost every Congress that has been in existence in the United States, both before and after the Constitution was written, by almost every president that served in the White House, and by the legislatures of all 50 states. It's also important to look at the extrapolation of this decision for any of you who've had time to read it. If not, you might want to read it, because essentially if you extrapolate the themes in this particular decision, you would have to determine that if the Declaration of Independence was written today and presented to this judge, she would make one of two determinations. She would either say that the signers of that document did not mean what they said when they said that our rights came from God himself, from a creator, and that they were pledging their lives and their fortunes and their sacred honor to defend that proposition, or she would determine that it was unconstitutional. Understand what that basically means. The very document that gave legitimacy to the Constitution, she is doing a bootstrap argument to basically say that document would have been unconstitutional. It's also important if you read this opinion that this judge basically says that her opinion is more important than the historical statements and actions of the people who drafted the Constitution and what they said because she indicates and says specifically in the opinion that just because they drafted the Constitution doesn't mean that they um, did actions that were in keeping with the Constitution. The other thing that's important is that we heed John Kennedy's great speech in his inauguration when he warned us that we needed to be careful that we defended the proposition of the Founding Fathers, which said that our rights did not come from the generosity of the state, but rather from the hand of God himself. The First Amendment that the Founders had never intended that it be placed as a restriction on ideas, thoughts, and opinions coming into the marketplace of ideas, but rather it was intended as a throttle to keep those ideas coming into that great marketplace. Because the founders of our great nation believed that in a marketplace of ideas, truth would win out. This decision is not representative of a vast majority of Americans, regardless of their faith or even their, non their non-faith, because they believe and they want an open marketplace of ideas. Rather, it is representative of a very small minority of individuals across the country. Understand that as stated in this decision, the purpose of the plaintiffs in this decision were to educate people on the non-existence of God. What you find here is that they do not want to compete in a marketplace of ideas for their proposition. They've had centuries to do that, and they've lost. What they want to do is to exclude concepts and ideas of faith and religion and morality from coming into that marketplace of ideas. So where do we go from here? I think just a couple of things. The first thing is we're here today to encourage the White House to make sure that they appeal this decision and that they fight as vigorously as possible to make sure this decision does not become the law of the land in the United States. Secondly, we'll be presenting a resolution 
one that's been written by Lamar Smith, also Todd Tehart, um, which will basically say that we believe the National Day of Prayer is constitutional and reaffirming um, our support of that document. Lamar Smith is not here today, but he wanted me to read this statement since he is the co-sponsor of one of these resolutions. And he says this, the recognition and celebration of the right of Americans to pray is in no way unconstitutional. Setting aside a day of prayer and thanksgiving is a national tradition that first began with George Washington. This is not an establishment of religion, which would be unconstitutional, but merely the acknowledgement of the role prayer has played in our nation's history and the importance of prayer. The National Day of Prayer imposes no duties or burdens on any Americans since anyone can choose to enjoy it or ignore it. If this is unconstitutional, what's next? Declaring the federal holiday for Christmas unconstitutional. Congress needs to send a clear message to the courts that we will not allow unelected federal judges to restrict the constitutional rights of Americans. The other thing we need to recognize is what these plaintiffs have as their strategy and this small minority of people who want to keep faith and religion out of the marketplace of ideas. They scour the country to attempt to shop for the forums that they think will be receptive to their ideas. And then they shop for the judges that they think will also be receptive. And then they focus their resources on that one area. We need to change our strategy and make sure we are carrying this debate, these ideas, across America every place we can, in all of our state legislatures, in every area and every venue that we can. And that's a message that we're sending out uh, today. We've got a number of people that have joined us today who want to express their thoughts about this. As I mentioned, Congressman um, Mike McIntyre is not here yet, but I think Mike is on his way. I would at this time like to uh, present one of the original co-sponsors of the 1988 law establishing National Day of Prayer, Congressman Frank Wolf. Frank. Thank you, Randy. It's good to be here. Uh, and with me is my uh, uh, colleague, uh, you ought to come on up there, uh, Congressman Tony Hall, uh, one of my best friends in uh, Congress. And Tony was the original sponsor of, of the bill. There were four of us on the bill at that time. It was Cong Congressman Hall, uh, then uh, former Congressman Bob, Bob Garcia, who lives out in the Northern Virginia area, and Congressman uh, Carlos Moorhead and, and, and myself, uh, the four of us. And we were together at the White House uh, with a joint group of people from every faith uh, where President Reagan signed, signed, signed the bill. Unfortunately, what brings us together today is a misguided court decision which threatens a long-standing tradition in this country. Since its founding, America has been shaped by a profound respect for religious freedom and a deeply held conviction that God is the author of our liberty. I urge uh, the Obama administration to appeal this decision to dedicate the best and the brightest minds at the Justice Department to this case to ensure that the rulings by the U.S. District Court of the Western District of Wisconsin does not stand. Prayer is part of the fabric of our shared national history. A hearty band of patriots who comprised the First Continental Congress made their first act an act of prayer. A nation ripped apart by civil war prayed for God's mercy. American presidents have issued 64, 164 proclamations calling on the people of, of our country to pray. And in closing in, in 1986, President Reagan issued one such proclamation. His words capture well the place of prayer in this country. He said, and I quote, indeed, the true meaning of our entire history as a nation can scarcely be glimpsed without some notion of the importance of prayer. Our declaration of dependence on God's favor on this unfinished enterprise we call America. On our National Day of Prayer, then we join together as people of many faiths to pet petition God to show his mercy and his love to heal our weariness and uphold our hope that we may live ever mindful of his justice and thankful for his blessing. And with that, I just introduced uh, the original uh, author and, uh, of the bill who put together the idea of former Congressman Tony Hall from uh, Dayton, Ohio. Tony? Thank you. I uh, used to represent Dayton, Ohio for 24 years. Uh, I'm a Democrat, and I was very proud to be the major sponsor of this legislation in 1988. 
Actually, it started uh, through a great lady uh, that some of you might know, Vonette Bright, who was with Campus Crusade for Christ, and she is the one who called me from California almost every night for about six months to, to keep on me to be sure that we could get this bill passed. Um, I understood right away what she was what she was saying to me because I I do understand that the power there is when people get together and they pray. It's uh, Frank Wolf and I have, have been buddies for a long time. Matter of fact, we still pray together every Tuesday that Congress is in session, Democrat and Republican, at four o'clock. We've been doing it for 25 years. We've never had an argument. We disagree. We often sometimes vote. We used to vote against each other all the time, but there was a lot of things that brought us together, family and human rights and hunger and a lot of issues. And we found a lot of things that through our wives and our children, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to get up and go to the floor of the house after you've prayed with your colleague and get mad. <laughs> you can't do it. It's impossible. And uh, I, you know, I've had to uh, get used to, you know, praying together here because uh, I know when I, when I started out, I, I wasn't a believer when I came to the Congress of the United States. I didn't, I didn't believe in much except myself. I became a believer. I fell in love with the Lord here. A lot of people laugh, and I oftentimes tell the joke that I was once introduced right after I was a believer, and a friend got up and said, now it's my pleasure to introduce Tony Hall. He's a U.S. congressman and a Christian. And there, there was a lot of laughs. An older man down front was squirming in his chair, and he finally hollered up because he couldn't take it much longer. He said, make up your mind, buddy. You can't be both. <laughs> <laughs> but I know in, in Washington, D.C., we, we have this issue that if we have a problem here, we, the way we solve it is not to pray. We say, well, we've got a problem. We, we've got to pass a bill. We've got to appropriate some money. Let's pass it, and oftentimes when we pass it, it doesn't do a heck of a lot of good because I think uh, we forget to check and we forget to, to be called to prayer. And can you imagine what the city would look like if we could start to pray together as Democrats and Republicans? The people in this country want that. And I know it goes on a lot among these men and women that are here and, and some that are not here. So what's wrong with the day of prayer? What is wrong with it? There's nothing wrong with it. There's power in it. There's strength. There's accountability. <coughs> and uh, we need to check with God and uh, find out and get some direction from him. So thank you very much for allowing me to be here. Tony, to you and Frank, we thank you for laying the foundation for this great resolution. And just to let you know that it continues to uh, this day, uh, I want to present at this time a dear friend of mine, um, Mike McIntyre, who co-chairs the Congressional Prayer Caucus, who happens to be a Democrat, but also happens to be a great friend of mine. Mike McIntyre. Thank you, Tony. I'm thrilled to be here with my esteemed colleagues who have such a rich history as uh, Tony and Frank Wolf have, des have described. Let me just say this, that um, when we look at the legal side of this, the law itself says that Congress, uh, that the President shall set aside and proclaim a suitable day each year, and it goes on to describe about the National Day of Prayer, but the key phrase here, it says, on which the people of the United States may, M-A-Y, mm -hmm. may turn to God in prayer and, and meditation. And when you think about that, that's not forcing anybody. Last time I heard that you may do something, that's not you shall, you may. So I think there's been a misunderstanding here from the legal side. Uh, it's not requiring people to do anything. It says that they may. And I think that three letter word clears it up. And of course, when we think about what it means to understand the National Day of Prayer, to say that our nation may turn to God, 
it's an opportunity for us to do what we've done historically, what our historic underpinnings are, and understanding the precedent that has been set. And that every president, Republican or Democrat, no matter what their religious background or faith has been, has issued these proclamations since they uh, were allowed to do so and chose to do so and were asked to do so. And we are pleased that they have, in fact, done so. Let me also mention something historically. You know, when we talk about our founding fathers, we, we do know many of them were people of great faith. One of those that we acknowledge uh, was probably not of the strongest religious faith, but was the oldest and probably seen as the wisest at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. And at the age of 81 stood up, that was a pretty old age today, it's a pretty old age way back then especially. And before that Constitutional Convention, adjourned to announce what they've been working on from May of 1787 till September of 1787. He stood up and, and told them to wait a minute. He said, there's something else we need to do. What did Ben Franklin himself say to the convention, which I think sets the tone what the National Day of Prayer is about when you put it in its historical context. And even someone like Ben Franklin, who was not known to be the most religious person, himself acknowledged the fact that we should be able to turn to God in prayer when he said, I've lived a long time, sir, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it likely that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, he said in the sacred writings, that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, he said, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. So what we're engaged in today is a fulfillment of that. We're engaged in all this Babel because people don't want to turn or be allowed to turn or say you may turn to God to ask for his concurring aid, as Ben Franklin himself said. So let's get real in terms of what the National Day of Prayer is, what the historic precedent is, what the facts are, what the law actually says, and what, indeed, our people as citizens should be able to do. God bless you all, and thanks for being here. Now, I just want to encourage you to, to uh, make sure we remember this. A lot of people are upset about this decision. I think this is a great time for us to have a lot of hope. When you see all these members, I want you to be able to hear from them. I'm going to do something now we've got to have prayer to do, and that is to ask you to keep your remarks to about 30 seconds or so <laughs> so that we can get all of these members uh, in because I want you to hear from them their thoughts on uh, this National Day of Prayer and this decision. I want to begin with Mike Pence, the uh, conference chairman of the Republican Party, followed by Lincoln Davis. Mike. Thanks, Randy. Let me lead by example. Um, thank Congressman Forbes, Congressman McIntyre for their leadership on this issue and uh, say what an honor it is to be able to share the podium with former Congressman Hall and my colleague Frank Wolf. To all those that are gathered here, let me say simply, the American people believe in prayer. The American people believe that prayer changes things by virtue of the fact that in 1952, Congress passed a law saying the President might set aside a day suitable for prayer, and thanks to the leadership of those that are gathered here, the uh, first Thursday in May is that day on which Americans may pray. We gather in this place to urge the administration in a bipartisan fashion to use all means at its disposal to challenge this decision and defend the importance of prayer in American life for all the American people. I'm Lincoln Davis from Tennessee's 4th Congressional District of Democrats. I'm honored that we are gathered here today, those of us who serve in the U.S. House, to be sure that the world knows, and certainly those who live in our great nation, that there are those of us who pray daily, and it's our wish and our hope, and to encourage others through our example that they too will look to God for guidance. I realized many, many years ago, as I studied the scriptures, I watched my mother and father wear a Bible lab with kerosene lamp in the late 40s and early 50s, literally wear the Bible lab and had to buy another one. I knew there was something in that book that would be a guiding light to me. And I realized as I become older that when God gave me my soul at conception and made me an American citizen, it was a unique blessing. And coming with that blessing, 
was a responsibility to be sure that others could see in me what God has done for me and what it will do and what it's done for our nation. So from my standpoint, I'm here today to, to charge our administration, as I'm certain they will do, to continue the proclamation that the day of prayer may be, may be every first Thursday of May as it has been in the past, and I think that will continue, and that we use all the efforts that we can with the very best and brightest lawyers to challenge this decision that's been made by one judge. And now what I'm going to do is ask our members if they would come up and rather than me taking time to introduce each one of them, I'm going to ask them to come up here, state their name, the state they're from, take about 30 seconds to tell you why this is important uh, to them. And why don't we just start over here. Phil, since you're on the end, why don't you come up first and do that. Thanks very much. Phil Rowe from the 1st Congressional District of Tennessee. And I know certainly prayer is important to everyone here. We have a prayer breakfast every Thursday morning at, at 8 o'clock for Democrats, Republicans. And I know what we did before we had the historic vote on health care. For the first time in 130 years, we met, we rotunded the Capitol, and we prayed together. And I think that spoke uh, volumes to me. I left that day feeling better. It has empowered me, and as a physician, I certainly have used prayer many times when, when a person's life is out of my hands. And I, it's hard for me to conceive that one person could turn over the will of over 300 million people the Congress and the President and the history of this country, and, and certainly I pray that we restore this day, this one judge is over time. Well, I certainly uh, appreciate being able to join all of my colleagues here today, and uh, I assume that Judge Crabb is, uh, is probably graduated from law school, but I suggest she go back to high school history and get a little bit of a sense of where we came from as a nation. If you go back to one of the early groups that came, we called them the Pilgrims. The pilgrims came with a vision and a dream for a new country. They came with the idea that they were going to, among other things, separate civil government from church government. They never thought of the idea of taking God out of anything or out of any type of government, but they got that idea out of the Bible, and they were thought to be kooks by the English citizens that they had left behind. But they started with that whole idea of the Bible being central to things, but they used it as a pattern to separate civil and church government. When we go forward in history a little bit, you come to a little tidbit that we just celebrated the 18th of April. That was the day that started the War of Independence. At the, about two weeks before that, the governor of Connecticut had called the state of Connecticut to a day of fasting and prayer for the people in Boston. He scheduled that day the 18th of April in 75. The very US Constitution, which was finally ratified in this country, uh, George Washington called the nation to a day of prayer, which we called the first Thanksgiving. And uh, so the very first event to ratify the U.S. Constitution, we had this day of prayer. So I recommend we send the judge back to uh, high school history and we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Adderholtz, representing the 4th Congressional District of Alabama. Let me say it's an honor to be here with my colleagues uh, this afternoon and uh, what a turnout we have here, not only of uh, members, but on both sides of the aisle who uh, really feel strongly about this issue. I had a group of uh, over 100 uh, high school students on the floor of the House of Representatives this morning, and I had an opportunity to uh, talk with them and point out some of the aspects about uh, this country and where we've come from and, and uh, hopefully where we're going. And one thing that I pointed out is the fact that uh, the uh, Founding Fathers, they did not want to impose religion on anyone. And I think everyone standing behind me would agree that imposing religion on anyone was not uh, the intent of the founders. However, uh, they uh, acknowledging God was something they thought was very important. And if you see the writings uh, from their personal letters, you look at the men who wrote the documents uh, of the Constitution, you'll see that they clearly felt it very strongly that this nation must acknowledge God uh, for those who wanted to and uh, make sure that it was uh, available for uh, any for anybody in this country who wanted to come together in prayer. So again, as it's been rightly pointed out, this uh, legislation talks about May. There's nobody imposing anything on anyone. But again, acknowledging God is something the Founding Fathers thought was very important. Thank you. I'm Paul Brown. I represent the 10th Congressional District of Georgia. Our second president, John Adams, said that our Constitution is written for moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate for the governance of any other. Just a little over a century ago, the US Supreme Court in a unanimous decision said that this is a Christian nation founded upon Christian principles. 
Every single member of Congress, every judge in this country swears to uphold the Constitution. This judge's ruling is totally unconstitutional, historically, as well as by the original intent of the Constitution. She's showing her arrogance, her ignorance, and her incompetence. Prayer has always been a fiber of our society. And prayer is extremely important for us to be able to go forward as a free people. This ruling is against freedom. It's a, for socialism. It's for what she is a, trying to establish her own religion of secular humanism and atheism. This ruling must not stand. Uh, Jim Jordan uh, from Ohio. Make no mistake about it. There is a struggle going on in our country over whose set of values, whose sets of principles are going to prevail. The secular left versus those of us who believe in Judeo-Christian tradition and heritage and truths uh, that are part of that. And my concern is, if we don't prevail on the values debate, we may not have the toughness, the tenacity, what it takes to prevail on the other big challenges. The economic and financial concerns we face, the terrorist threat we face, it is really that important and I think in, in, in it's really that fundamental. And so I'm proud to join my colleagues um, for such a time as this, to stand up for those things that, uh, that truly matter and truly make us the special nation that we are. Thank you. I'm Todd T. Hart from the 4th District of Kansas. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to be here with uh, my colleagues acknowledging that we need to have prayer in our culture, in our society. Yesterday I introduced a resolution, H.R. Res 1279, that recognizes the history of prayer in this country and encourages the administration to appeal this decision. It's been supported by Jay Seclo and the ACLJ. But you know, if you go back to our history in our nation's birthright, the Declaration of Independence, it says in the second paragraph, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Creator with a capital C, a supreme power that has given us creation. And prayer acknowledges that supreme power and, and advocates for its intervention in our lives. As people of faith, we live out our faith in this country. We are a country based on Judeo-Christian values. And you don't have to look very far to get evidence of it. You can look at Haiti, where we had such great intervention from America. You can look at the, the uh, tsunami in Southeast Asia, where not only did taxpayers send a billion dollars for the recovery of that area, but Americans <coughs> dipped into their own pocket and sent another billion dollars. Following the scriptures, where it says, do unto others, uh, as you would have them do unto you. Whatsoever you do to the least of these, you do unto me. Those scriptures are something that uh, some would like to exclude from our culture, from our society. But it's our fiber. It is what we're made of. It's who we are. And we live it by living our faith. So I hope that we get this decision repealed and acknowledge this, um, the, the creator with a capital C. God bless you all and God bless America. Michelle Bachman from Minnesota's 6th Congressional District. It seems to, like every time a federal district court judge opens up his court, we have a new constitutional convention that occurs. And that seems like what's happened now in the case of Judge Barbara Craig, or Crabb. She's made a decision that seems on its face patently absurd because what she is saying is that it's unconstitutional to put into effect the second half of the First Amendment, which which denies Congress the right to prohibit the free exercise of religious faith. There's a balancing test that goes on in the First Amendment. Congress is not allowed to establish religion, which means we aren't going to have a national church, but the other side of that tension is that Congress can also not prohibit the free exercise of religion. People need to be able to have that right. And in what is simply an absurd decision, the judge seems to be outlawing the second half of the First Amendment, which means that government cannot prohibit people's free exercise of, of religion. So I think it's interesting what this decision is about, but again, the American people's voice needs to prevail, and we're all here standing as one group, saying that we stand for the Constitution. The Constitution means something, and we're here to defend it.